This is More Than Work, the podcast reminding you that your self-worth is made up of more than your job title. Each week, I'll talk to a guest about how they discovered that for themselves. You'll hear about what they did, what they're doing, and who they are. I'm your host, Rabia. I work in IT, perform stand-up comedy, write, volunteer, and, of course, podcast. Thank you for listening. Here we go. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to More Than Work. I am really excited today because I have a good friend joining me who I talk to all the time anyway, so it's just going to be a more structured conversation now. And we practically podcast together because we send each other so many voice notes. But this is my friend, Mark Nicholas. He's a comedian, workshop lead, and tutor. So thanks for being on, Mark. Oh, yeah. No, thanks for having me. And it, it, it's true that we do do a lot of WhatsApp podcasts anyway, but it, it tends to be uh, a lot of bitching about other people on the comedy scene. No, no, no. We, we talk nicely. Yeah, yeah. No, we, and obviously, we, you know, we big up the people who are doing brilliantly. But, you know, that's a podcast for another time, I think. I think that's its own separate podcast. It definitely is. So where am I talking to you from today? You are talking to me from East London. Well, it's East London slash Essex. There's always a difference between the two because, like, you know, my postcode is Essex, but I'm about 10, 15 minutes from East London. So I just like to say East London because if you're not from the UK, you don't know where Essex is. So it's <laughs> easier. Yeah. So East yeah. London. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. And, you know, I'm in Camden. So, yeah, we're pretty close, but still far enough away. And I guess so. I mean, obviously, we met on the comedy circuit. We've already mentioned comedy, which is one of the rules of being a comedian. We have to mention it within the first five seconds of talking to someone right but <laughs> before you were a comic and even when I met you you were doing something else which you were working in a school and you were also really involved in the union which I think is one thing that we connected on is just your involvement in things mm. in general but can you talk about kind of your work in schools and how you got an education and also like just the union stuff so I think that it kind of happened quite early on for me when I was studying at university I needed some extra work. So I started working in a bar and I absolutely hated it because I, with my autism, I'm very dyspraxic, very clumsy. So I'd always be dropping pints of beer and I could never do the cocktails right. And I think I remember one time I was, someone asked me to make them like one of those mockers, chocolate coffees thing, mm -hmm. and you have to use the little coffee machine. But what I did, I went up back, just put the spoon of instant coffee, put the spoon of hot chocolate, stuck hot water in, put some milk in, and that was it because I couldn't walk the machine. They drank it and they didn't even notice it. So I was – but it was like, you know, I never even changed the bottle. You know, I didn't even change the thing. So I was just a terrible barman and it was just way too stressful. So I was like, I need something else. I know I need the money while I'm studying, but – so then I started, I did an advert on Gumtree. I'm not sure if you ever remember Gumtree and people still use it, I think. There was a job advert and there was this woman whose son had Asperger's, which is the form of autism I have. And they were looking for a social skills tutor because he was really bad at trying to make friends. He's a, one of the brightest kids I ever met, but he was really bad at socialising with other kids. And... I ended up writing a letter about my story growing up and things like that and how I've overcome adversity. I've never taught before, but I'd love to try and do some one-to-one -one tuition. And the mum, she really loved the letter. I met him and his brothers and her, and we ended up, you know, like hitting it off. But what was what was strange about it was she was like, well, how much an hour do you, do you want? And I was like, oh, just minimum wage. And and true fact, my mum came with me because, <laughs> no, because, because obviously I'd never, you know, I was meeting this woman and her family. It was quite yeah, hard. Yeah. And I was 18 years old and the boy in question was about 10, right? And, and then, and then my mum was like, you're, and then she spoke to me privately, Mark, you're more valuable than that, £10 an hour at least. So my mum was acting as my union rep almost. So <laughs> that, that was kind of, you know, planting the seeds about like the kind of union thing. Anyway, I ended up tutoring him for about maybe six, seven years, but he ended up getting through school great, making friends, getting on better with his brothers and sisters, difference 
I intend to make was not just him, but his family as well, was a really positive difference. So when I started doing that, I started, oh, I quite like this. So I was a student ambassador at my university, like a disability ambassador, right? So I'd support other disabled students when, when I was in my second or third year. And I remember going to schools in the area doing talks about mental health. I was like 19, 20 years old and and I just got so much out of it and I thought, well, this is, I like this. This is what I want to do. And one of the people working at the university, her son was going to a local school. She went, oh, I'll put in a good word for you and you can apply as a teacher assistant after you graduate. So I graduated and I applied to become a teacher assistant at a school in North London, actually, and it was a Catholic school, mm-hmm. right? So it was an all-boys Catholic school, but they had an autism unit. So I was a teacher assistant there, and I was working one-to-one with a lot of the students. But what I didn't, what I found out the minute I worked there was that was a school my dad used to go to because oh, wow. ca- yeah, he had a Catholic background. So I remember telling him where I was, and he was like, "Yeah, I was. I went to that school, and I was kicked out of it." <laughs> so, <laughs> but I don't think anyone took teaching him was still there. They didn't pay very well, so I had to move on. Then I was in a primary school working one to one with an autistic boy, and then my last job in education was in an SEN school. And I was there for 10 years and I, I tried to do a bit of teacher training there, but it was too stressful. I was like, no, I can't do teaching. Because te- I don't, I didn't mind the actual teaching itself, but it was all the paperwork. Every teacher mm-hmm. in the UK will tell you what, regardless of setting you work in the paperwork is you take your home, you take your work home with you. You go in at seven, get back at six. Mm-hmm. And it's so ridiculously hard. And then I just ended up being a cover supervisor there because they could see I could teach. And then one of the other teachers, who's the union rep at the time, decided she needed to move on. And then that position opened up. And I was like, oh, I might be interested in doing that because I'd always been interested in politics. Like what I studied at university was sociology. So I was very politically aware, like, I used to go on marches. I went on the student march when they trampled the tuition fees in the UK. And I remember talking to actually another American about this. And, and they were like, 9,000 a year, Mark, that's nothing. That's cheap. And I was like, <laughs> and then they told me about the US system. I was like, oh, Christ, that is mental. Yeah, I'm 44 and just paid off my loans this year. That's insane. I was the last year of the 3000 a year fees. Yeah. But with interest, and even though I got a grant and other bits because I grew up in a single parent family, even though I got all those bits, there was still the loans, the tuition, and they've added interest on the student loans. Coming. Yeah. I'm still paying it off. Like, I end up coming about, out about 17000 in debt, which doesn't sound like a lot, but they keep adding interest on every year. So, I think I'm still about 17,000 in the <laughs> yeah. it's It's a ridiculous system. But anyway, I was the union rep for a while at the school. And then I like to say I oversaw about three different CEOs, so the big <laughs> bosses, because they would try and like, change like the way the school was and try and get rid of people and stuff like that. It was a kind of really toxic culture. But then I built kind of I got people to join the National Education Union mm-hmm. and, in the school and we got together I used to try and talk with management all the time about stopping these changes and they wouldn't and then we balloted for strike action and they end up getting rid of the CEO the bald dudes once I think and then <laughs> and then and it was just this it felt very powerful being such a an incredible collective but then we had the group of these brothers coming in that took over the school and they knew I was the union rep and I said, we need to meet once a week because I want positive dialogue. So I was being open, but I'd heard rumours they'd gone into schools and they were like called the union killers because they used to just get rid of, I mean, legally you can't, but what they yeah. did, they restructured the school, which meant my position was redundant. Mm. and they were trying to get rid of what's called midday assistants. Some people in the UK will know them as dinner ladies or if you're men. So basically, in the US, like people working in a cafeteria at yeah. school, I don't know what you call them. Cafeteria lady. Yeah, whatever. So then, Or man, but then you just... 
Yeah, a cafeteria know. person. So they're called midday yeah. assistants because they work in midday. And when we work in a special school, they kids need feeding in a certain way because some kids have a lot of physical disabilities. But they were going to get rid of them. They were expecting the teachers and the teacher assistants to work in their lunch hour. Crazy. So they would get rid of me, get rid of them. And I remember, again, we tried to talk about it. There was a consultation period. And again, we tried to ballot. And I remember phoning all these members from the school going, uh, did you receive your ballot yet? And then the head teacher went around saying I was harassing people. <laughs> like he was doing all the dirty tricks in the book. And in the end, you need to reach a 50% ballot thing to for it to be approved. But the first round of balloting, it got like 90%. It, it was what's called an indicative ballot, saying you're mm-hmm. prepared to vote on strike. And then the second lot was it was under 50% for ballot action. So we it didn't go through and I ended up just taking the redundancy package. Mm. Like I could appeal and stuff like that, but I just, I thought, you know what, I'm done there. If people weren't, because as union rep, I used to go in and sit in the one-to-one meetings and like, the amount of times I was dealing with cases around long COVID, a lot of teachers not being able to get back to work because of long COVID and other disabilities, other mental health. I remember sitting there and basically just reminding management what the employment laws were, like mm-hmm. not what you can and can't do and how you need to make adjustments to people. Because one of the biggest things that fallacies about autism is that they, we have lack empathy, but I'm probably one of the most empathetic people out there because I used to, I'm not, I am big myself up now. I never used to, but I was like, no, I did a lot for those people. Yeah. And then I felt that I was there for all these different people, but then when my job was under threat. Yeah. The thing about union, it needs to be collective. Yeah. They didn't reach out to, they didn't support me in that. And so I thought, well, do you know what? Because I could have, what I could have done, I could have applied for a lower position. So it's fire rehire, they call it, but for a mm-hmm. lower with worse conditions. I thought, do you know what? I've had 10 years there. I don't want to do it. And so I just took the redundancy and, you yeah. know, told them where to stick it. And then the irony is they restructured the school. The irony, these two brothers that were in charge of the school resigned because of financial irregularities. And this isn't confirmed, but what I heard happened is they made people redundant and they were employing them back towards their own agency. And if you if you work for a supply agency, you don't have any of the workers' rights. Yeah. So they're making people redundant, they're re-employing them through their own teaching agency mm. and they were profiteering off the school, even though they would get wages by the school. But there was an investigation into that and they just resigned. Oh, so, wow. yeah. and this was after I left, I got all this gossip and I was like, wow, I left at the right time. It was a sinking ship there. So yeah. it was, it was a really stressful period of my life. And oh yeah, that's not to mention that I went out to Vietnam halfway through, like my dad passed yeah. away mm. and I went out to Vietnam for about seven months. And that's when I started doing comedy, Vietnam of all places. Like I, I joined this expat group. It was like this creative poetry, comedy, spoken word group. And we ended up doing this showcase and I did my first comedy set in Saigon and it was incredible. Mm. So that was halfway through when I was at that school because I'd taken a sabbatical, like a career break because of my dad. So mm-hmm. it's been a very eventful, since I've been an adult and going out into the world of work, yeah. It's been very eventful, a lot of stuff happening. But, yeah, that's basically kind of my story. Yeah, yeah. So I've been the comedy on the side, and then that's slowly been gaining momentum as well because now I, I get the odd paid work here and there. But you know this as well. I'm at my own disability comedy night. I'm starting to run workshops, comedy workshops. I'm doing my first one tomorrow. Oh, well, no, I did one a couple of years ago, but we're doing another set of workshops for – disabled adults in our local area so i'm still doing the teaching but through workshopping and then i'm doing a bit a home tutoring as well so i'm doing bits of everything and i'm self-employed at the moment i quite like it but i think i'll send you towards the podcast it's like spinning lots of different plates at once i'm not used to doing all these different things yeah. used to having one job and that's it now my life is a series of different things 
Yeah, totally. Well, and so I guess, so there's a lot there, but I mean, yeah, yeah there's a lot. <laughs> no, it's okay though. But so I think just one thing is that you just kind of realizing that you shouldn't, you didn't need to be at the school anymore. Cause a lot of times, and I even had, we had redundancies at work yesterday, which you and I haven't talked about yet, but I'll, we'll talk to you about it later yeah. as a friend. But, you know, there's something about wanting to fight for something that you don't, and realizing you don't need to fight for it anymore. And by that time you were doing comedy anyway, right? So. Yeah. I, the thing is, right, I love the whole kind of working with people with disabilities and empowering them and things like that. And uh, I've always been like that. And, and like my grandmother was a primary school teacher and my other grandmother, I had two grandmothers, my other grandmother on my mum's side was a care worker. So that kind of runs in that family about wanting to care for and look after and support those with vulnerabilities. And because I went through those things, felt mm. like giving back. And my mum worked for a disability charity, which is what sponsors my night now, which is and is helping me with his workshops. So that was always important to me. So working in a special needs setting, I did get something out of it, but the education system in the UK, I mean, again, that's another podcast in itself. There's too much focus on trying to fit everyone into the same umbrella. And a lot of kids with SEN are shoved out from mainstream to special needs schools because the mainstream schools cannot meet their needs. And that never used to be the case. It used to be because I was a kid with SEN and I were I was in a mainstream all my life. But if I was a kid today with autism, because of my behaviour problems, I'd be in a special needs school. They're segregating children with disabilities more with mainstream kids. Mm -hmm. So the system in itself is very flawed at the moment. And what's that Einstein said? If you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid. And I think that's what's wrong with the UK education system in a nutshell. Mm. And that's why I don't want to be a part of it. Mm. Like, I really don't. I, I'd rather do these workshops and, and perform the comedy and things like that. So, because with the comedy, I'm teaching comedy. I'm teaching a bit of improv as well but I'm doing it on my own terms. And actually with the home tutoring at the moment, it's on my own terms. And a lot of time I'm teaching young, I'm teaching older teenagers or younger adults independent skills. So I'm still doing the teaching in a lot of ways, but I'm doing it how I want to do it. And there's yeah. something very empowering about that. I didn't fall out of love with teaching. I fell out of love with the education system. Right. And it needs to dramatically change if I ever thought about getting back into that. Yeah, that makes sense. And it just, yeah, it sounds like it's a really difficult place to be. And I mean, I think in the States, there's similar things going on. And I have a friend whose child has, I don't know, well, I know what it's called, but I don't want to say the wrong name. But basically, he has definitely has difficulties. And, and it's hard because she's now become an advocate for him, though, which I'm really proud of her for. But I think and that's what you've done. And so just the, along those lines, like you're very open about your autism mm. and you've made me more open about stuff I have going on. But what do you think it is that just made you decide like this is something you were going to be open about and something that you were going to take on as a cause and disabilities in general, do you think? Well, I think it was when I was working with the boy I was working with, to be honest, when I was working with him, I was making a difference to his life because my whole feeling is that I found it so difficult, but the people that supported me helped me get to where I've got to. I wouldn't be here without my family, friends, partners, etc. For everyone, you know, I I was very fortunate to have a large support network growing up, but I wanted to give some of that back because it was like, well, actually, he deserves that support, and I believe every young person deserves that support because and this is where it goes into the social model of disability as well 
in the social model of disability, for those that don't know, is basically society disables us. The way society is set up is set up for neurotypical people, set up for neurotypical people and able-bodied people. It's not set up for neurodiverse people. It's not set up for those with disability. It's you know I was even given a talk the other day. I was running helping by this panel show on ITV Able with a fantastic colleague of ours, Betty Shakes, and and we were talking about like disability and inclusion in the arts, and talking about actually the reason, part of the reason I'm in comedy, and part of the reason I wanted to set up Laugh Able is because the amount of when I first was on the scene, the amount of disabled comics that told me they couldn't access certain nights Mm. i thought well let me provide a space then because and i think the reason i've been so open about it is because my family were as well with the autism and the disability like i was my mum again worked for the charity my nan was a care worker like i was surrounded Uh, and my old two older brothers were like incredibly supportive of I was like bullied horrendously at school and I people would manipulate me into doing things and I thought they were my friend and they weren't. I had a real hard time, but my family, because they gave me all that support, I felt like, well, yeah, this is something I should do now. And I think, you know, and then this is why it goes back to the union thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we're stronger together than we are apart. I think in general, that's a really important message. People collectively get together. Actually, it makes our lives better rather than having this individual focus of I'm only going to look out for myself. However, there is a worry that, you know, you don't look out for yourself whatsoever. I've got I've got into positions where I was promising to help all these people and then I'd let people down because I overpromised. So there is that balance between looking out for others and self-care. Mm-hmm. And that's something I'm trying to work out at the moment. You need to find a balance between looking after yourself and being there for others. So it's, yeah, it's an interesting one. But yeah, like yeah. I'm so open about it because my family were open about it. I was embarrassed when I had autism. I would deny I even had it. Mm-hmm. But my family was so like, Mark, this is your difficulties let's not shy away from it. They didn't want to shy away from it. They weren't embarrassed about it. So therefore, why should I be? Mm-hmm. But when I was in school, it was an embarrassing thing to have. Sure. So, but again, my family are a big part of the reason why I'm so open-minded with it. Yeah. And I, I noticed, I mean, you, and you're very much an advocate for people also in the LGBTQIA plus community and then with other disabilities besides autism. And everything, yeah, which I think is really important. And so let's talk about let's talk about comedy. You did comedy in Saigon. That's a you know that's the path. You know that's the normal path. Everyone I met, yeah, 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 (laughs) of course. You know Saigon, that's where you go to. But no, do you know what? It's it was. I've always been a fan of comedy. Like I used to watch comedy all the time. It's my favorite genre of movie. Um, I used to go watch stand-up comedy all the time. When I was 19, I used to go to Backyard Comedy Club in Bethnal Green because it's around the corner from where I am. And now, you know, I can say I've performed there, which yeah. is really cool. I didn't think in about 12 years' time I'd end up doing that. But, yeah, also as well, I did a lot of drama at school. My middle brother, uh, I'd like to say, was an actor. He's not no longer acting, but he's running an acting school now performance in the family is quite common Mm -hmm. so I loved drama at school I loved improv at school because it allowed me to mask certain things about me like because I was embarrassed about who I was and actually drama provided that initial masking where you can take on the role of someone else and for an hour pretend you're not you and so I love performing. I love being a performer. I was always, I was, I used to get a lot of stage fright though. So loads of people helped me through that. But so when I had the opportunity to do comedy, I thought, well, screw it. I'm out here anyway. I might as well give it yeah. a go. I didn't think it'd lead to much. And I remember my first set, I started trying to do, started trying to speak froze completely. Yeah. And the, and the, and the compare said, 
All right, let's give a round of applause for Mark here, Mark, because this is his first time doing this. So he was very supportive. We went, and then he said, and then I was still froze, and he was like, Mark, I will whisper your own jokes back at you. Mm. You can do this. And so eventually, once I started doing it, then just the laughter, the applauses I got from it. And I was only on there for five minutes. Right. But the adrenaline rush, oh, this is better than any drug I've taken, than any, uh, you know, booze or whatever, or jumping off a cliff, sod all that. Being on stage for five minutes is enough adrenaline for me, but I felt such a buzz afterwards that this is something I wanted to do. But then I came back to London, I chickened out for a year, I was like, no, I don't, I don't want to do the open mic scene in London because in London we have these things called bringer nights where you have to bring friends. And uh, I thought, well, after about 10 gigs, I'm not going to be able to bring anyone after and that's going to be it for me. Yeah. But it's fine, I could just bring along my twin. Then when I sit down and I could only do that once and the next gig, <laughs> I just pretend to be him. And then I sit back down, yeah, I pretend to be him. Well, that's me. But no, like, I, yeah, so it took me a year because London, I didn't feel like I was very supportive right. in terms of you You had to do all these things in order to, to perform. Yeah. And then I did another comedy course in London and I did the showcase at a place called the Comedy Pub, which is now the Coach and Horses. And it was such an amazing experience. I was like, right, I'm doing this again. And, and I ended up doing another course as well called Ultra Comedy. They were working with cancer research. And so you had to do, you had to bring, you didn't have to pay for the course, but you had to bring 10 people along yeah. who paid £20 each to see you perform for five minutes. But I mean, I uh, uh, performed out Backyard, which is really cool. And so obviously I'd like to give a shout out to our two comedy tutors that I had in this week, Tams and Kelly and Mike Gard. They were absolutely brilliant oh and the american the one who did the course who ran the course in saigon he was called ben bettersby he was really cool so those three people in terms of course tutors were really supportive and in terms of me doing my comedy so yeah it's been a wild ride i think for a while i was like oh i don't know if i want to do this anymore but you know, then and then lockdown happened as well, so that fucked everyone. No, but yeah, COVID uh, happened, and that's when we met. It was online. online. Yes, we we gigs. Yeah, on, yes, on the old Zoom gigs, which a lot of people complained about, right? But I can't be too mad about those Zoom gigs because I won King Gong, the comedy store's competition over Zoom, which meant I now get means I get regular spots at the comedy store. I. Ended up getting signed to a comedy agency through Zoom gigs. So when people go, oh, wasn't Zoom gigs horrible? Oh, I did. I hardly did. And I'm there going, actually, it was fine. Yeah. And actually, it brought the disability community together because it's when I yeah. met Benny Shakes, who, again, put me in touch with his agent. That's how we got signed. But me and Benny create this disability support group. We end up doing all these wonderful gigs. We end up doing a lot of fundraisers for mental health charities. Rosie Jones headlining, Andrew Neil headlining, John Robertson headlining. The reason I could afford to bring those acts over Zoom, because you're just doing it by your bedroom. You're not having to travel. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think every comic, pro or non-pro, was so desperate for stage time. Yeah, sod it. Why not? Let's do a Zoom. And I think it, a lot of people with disabilities that wouldn't have thought about getting into comedy did the Zoom gigs. So I think actually for disabled people, it is actually the most accessible form of comedy. Well, yeah, you don't have to get in, get in a tube. You don't have to like get to a basement. You don't have to do all that. I mean, it, it, it is ridiculous. Like people cannot get to places or once they're there, get in them at this point. Yeah. So like, I, I think Zoom gigs are great. I think they were brilliant. Yeah. But yeah. Plus, yeah. Plus we met there. So yeah. Well, I, I had, I mean, that was one of the downsides, but no more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fine. Oh, I'm hanging up now. So thank okay. you for having me on this. Yeah. You're going to miss me for the whole time now. Like, <laughs> exactly. we this big inspirational speech is going to be all on you because <laughs> I made a joke about you, you sensitive snowflake. Or... And then it'll be the highest rated episode. Cancel Mark Nicholas. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That could be, I think that's what it's going to be called the episode now. But so I've had uh, Philip Simon on who we both know and Rich Wilson. And I asked them both this question. I want to ask you, 
what was the first joke you wrote? Like, do you remember what the first joke you wrote, wrote is? And if you want to tell it. Oh, God. I remember uh, the first joke I did in London. Okay. Oh, no. A lot of your listeners. It was... Hmm. It was it was genuinely an in, a joke about incest. I mean, <laughs> I do you want to hear it? No. Yeah, because yeah, there, I'll do a trigger warning, and yes, let's do it. Okay, so uh, and we're not related. Kind of, that just so you know, so that's not part of the joke. Yeah, yeah, we're we're not related, and it's okay. So, bit of context for people outside the UK. This joke is about a guy called Danny Dyer, who's this East End cockney london guy who's been in eastenders and all that anyway so like so daddy dyer has a daughter called daddy dyer because he's that creative as a person mm-hmm. right and oh fuck daddy dyer's gonna kill me i know and, and, and so and on love island daddy dyer's daughter went on love island oh. that must have been really hard for him to watch like imagine interviewing him about that Danny, it must be so hard seeing your daughter with all these men on Love Island. Yeah, yeah, it is so hard. I tell you another thing. It's the hardest wank I've ever had. Oh God. <laughs> yeah, like think that is the most hackiest joke I've ever written. I'm not proud of it, by the way. But it was. But, but but also also one of I'm not going to say the I'm not going to say who it was, but the person, the tutor who was part of my course with me told me to lean into it and go really like messed up with it. So I was just like, okay, fine. And I remember doing that in front of my mum and going, oh what? And then she was like, oh god, Mark, I didn't know you're going to do this type of humour. And I was like. <laughs> In all fairness, I dropped that joke about, uh, um, yeah, about five gigs in. So, the, the, yeah, I'm just, I'm just like, you've asked me to do a bit of my old material, and now people go like, who's well, this shit comic that Rabbi yeah. has got on the show? <laughs> no, I mean, that's just, but it shows how far we come. And, like, like Philip, I think, told a joke he kind of told when he was a kid. Like, he remembered something it wasn't really a joke he wrote but it was like some comment he made to his dad and then rich had a joke too that was pretty wild so no that's good i'll be fair mark and let you tell a joke that you like from now how about that you're the only one i will let do this oh i wrote a joke in lockdown that i quite liked actually that i haven't brought back yet so i might try it again for you now so this genuinely happened right during lockdown i had my appendix out i got appendicitis Oh, wow. I remember, like, having the surgery, get my appendix out, and then a week later, performing a comedy. And the promoter said to me afterwards, oh, God, Mark, that took some guts. <laughs> <laughs> I had the audience in stitches. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, they were really, they really hated that joke. They were scarred from it. <laughs> Like that. No. And they were scarred for life. That's it. They were scarred for life. Like, so there you go. That's a joke I actually wrote. I often write joke about trauma as well. Like all messed up things I've been to. So yeah, but, yeah, well, it's part of it, right? So, so one thing I like to ask everybody who's on the the podcast is, do you have like any advice or mantra you want to share? It could be something you kind of follow, or just something that while we're talking, you thought of like this is something I'd want to leave with people. Always try. I feel like that's always try, even when you're crying yourself to sleep. Carry on pushing through the barrier. Don't rest at all. Don't just have no. no. Um, I think it's. I think there's a number of things. So know your worth as well. Like I think I, I spent a lot of time not knowing my the value of myself. Really. However, always know that sort of life is a journey. And actually, my partner Kate said this to me the other day progress isn't linear it Mm. isn't this straightforward thing that we all think it's actually very up and down there different things that happen to you so no matter what happens know that yeah progress isn't linear yeah and and actually the journey you go through between your start and end point can really shape you so yeah so when you're feeling at your lowest know that it will pass 
and know that the only way is up. Yeah. If when you're at your lowest, the only way to go is up. So, yeah. and also, yeah, talk to people, make sure you have a good group of people around you that you trust and know, or even that one person, you know, and you trust. So lots of things there really. Just, yeah. 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 So you had advice. All right. So now the last set of questions I call the fun five because they're fun for me. And it's just a list of questions I like to ask everybody. It's because um, like I said, it's fun. So what's the oldest t-shirt you have and still wear? So you know what? I threw out a lot of my old t-shirts last year, but oh God, I, the reason I did is because I can't get away wearing them now, not in terms of the age thing, but in terms of the fact that I put on that much weight that it just looks like a kid's shirt now. There was the Green Day American Idiot, you know, the hot yeah. hand on the hot grenade. Yeah. Because I was a bit of a punk when I was a teenager, so I used to wear a load of band hoodies. And so I wore that Green Day one, American Idiot, that T-shirt yeah. that I wore up until last year before I had to throw it away. Nice. So, yeah. That's cool. I like it. I, I think you said American Idiot with too much exaggeration just now, but that's fine. I won't idiot. Think Sorry, what was that? <laughs> huh? <laughs> okay. So if every day was really Groundhog's Day, like the movie where he woke up and it was the same day every day, if every day was like that in real life, what song would you have your alarm clock set to play every morning? I guess We Didn't Start the Fire by Billy Joel. I think it has to be. Nice. Okay, cool. And coffee or tea or neither? Can I say both? Sure. Yeah. Let's mix this up a bit because, again, I'm new and diverse, so I want to go out there. No, so coffee I have to have in the morning because it gives you that boost, right? And then when I'm starting to come down early afternoon because coffee gives you the instant buzz and then the crash, then early afternoon I have a cup of tea. I actually had a cup of tea just now. And that gives you that slow boost towards the end of the day nice yeah all right and so can you think of something that makes you like laugh so hard you cry or like just something that just cracks you up and you think of it just whatever it is so i would say anytime i see piers morgan make a fool of himself <laughs> i think it's just the most beautiful thing to watch ever I think whenever he puts his foot in it, it's just, it's absolutely glorious because it's, he's such an idiot. You know, I know, I know people in the States aren't exactly a fan of him either. No. So, but you can keep, you can keep him. We don't want him anymore. It's fine. We gave you James Corden back. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Thanks for that one. So, <laughs> um, okay. And the last question is who inspires you right now? I don't really want to say anyone in particular, but okay. I would say other disabled artists on the comedy scene right now, because I think it's brilliant watching everyone have their own unique story. And I'm very, I'm in a very privileged position where I've worked with so many incredible dis disabled artists. So yeah, I think nice. disabled artists, they, they inspire me at the moment. They, yeah, it's, I, I don't like using the word inspiration to describe disability because I know that annoys a lot of people. But in terms of, it's just amazing hearing about everyone's individual stuff going on yeah. and different perspectives as well. So, yeah. Yeah, and willingness to share. Yeah, that's cool. All right, so Mark, what do you want to promote right now? Like, what, where should people come find you if you want to talk about anything upcoming? So how do you want people to find you and, and what do you want to to look for so my insta and tiktok is at mark nicholas comic i'm trying to do better put more content on there and my twitter is m nicholas comic i wanted it to be the same as mark nicholas comic but bloody elon mark nicholas comedian on facebook i promote a lot of my stuff on there yeah laugh able comedy night on all the socials and if you search that, if you are London-based, run a disability and mental health comedy, uh, sorry, an award-winning mental health and disability comedy like called Laugh Able. And, and, we, and I run Laugh Able the first Wednesday of every month. So it's Bring Your Own Booze as well. It's a fully accessible venue as well. So it's in the area of uh, Wanstead, Essex. So 
if you get tickets in advance for general admission, it's three pound fifty. For disability, it's one pound fifty. And if you come on the door, it's a fiver each. So it's worth getting advance tickets for that. If you search for our events, then that's when you can find me. And I, I, I put all my uh, gigs up on the socials anyway. So yeah. Yeah. That's cool. it. Well, thank you, Mark. Thanks for chatting with me. It's been great. No, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you for having me on. Thanks for listening. You can learn more about the guest and what was talked about in the show notes. Joe Mafia created the music you're listening to. You can find him on Spotify at Joe, M-A-F-F-I-A. Rob Metke does all the design, for which I am so grateful. You can find him online by searching Rob, M-E-T-K-E. Please leave a review if you like the show and get in touch if you have feedback or guest ideas. The pod is on all the social channels at at More Than Work Pod or at Robbie Comedy on TikTok and the website is morethanworkpod.com. While being kind to others, don't forget to be kind to yourself.